good morning. If you please turn with me in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 12. I'll be reading from two passages this morning. Uh, the first is from Exodus chapter 12, and uh, we've been doing sermon requests, and today's sermon request is mine. Um, so uh, I'm uh, preaching on the Lord's Supper. We've been discussing for more than a year moving from a monthly observance of the Lord's Supper to a weekly, and a lot of you have given feedback, some in writing, some um, just uh, conversationally. Um, I'm thinking, and the session is still working on this, uh, but moving to um, a more frequent, a weekly observance uh, in th at the beginning of uh, in January. But before we make any change, uh, assuming that we do change, I wanted to preach a few times on the Lord's Supper and give some rationale for changing and give you a few more uh, months for feedback. Um, <clears throat> the reason we're reading from um, Exodus chapter 12 uh, is because the historic background for the Lord's Supper was the Passover. Uh, the Passover was celebrated um, as the, the tenth plague came upon the Egyptians. So you remember in the book of Exodus, it's about God's people exiting. That's why it's called the Exodus Egypt. And uh, God remembering his covenant, his promise that he had given to Abraham. And uh, you have the, the blood, the frogs, the gnats, the flies, the livestock, the boils, the hail, the locusts, the darkness, and then the, the death of the firstborn uh, here in Exodus chapter uh, 12. So the Egyptians have been hearing uh, the word of God. The, the people of God have been hearing uh, the, the word of God, uh, which was fairly simple, let my people go, uh, that they may serve me. And as Pharaoh said no, as he hardened his heart, as God hardened Pharaoh's heart, uh, God continued to the, give the warnings of, of judgment. And the, the final judgment uh, that led to uh, Pharaoh and the Egyptians saying, go, right? So it's let my people go, and they will say, go. And here in Exodus chapter 12, so, uh, so the, the nine plagues have happened in, in context, that the tenth is happening, God reveals to Moses what his people are going to do. So that the, the heart of Pharaoh is, is hardened, and now instruction is being given what God's people are, are to do in preparation for uh, the final judgment and being prep prepared to be redeemed and let out of Egypt. There are many parallels, of course, uh, with the, the new covenant observance of Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us and the preparing for the return of Jesus. Um, just to draw your attention to a, a few verses here in Exodus chapter 12, as we'll be reading from it. Uh, verse 1 of Exodus chapter 12, we learn that this is the beginning of months. Not notice that. Now the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall be the beginning of months for you. It is to be the first month of the year for you. So this is such an important uh, historical event for Israel's calendar um, that it, the calendar changed. <clears throat> in fact, the Hebrew word Bereshit, that's the, how the book of Genesis begins. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now there's a, a new beginning. And here's the beginning of Israel as a, a nation. This is, of course, one of the reasons why the calendar has changed in the new covenant and why we assemble on the first day of the week. There's been a greater uh, redemptive act and a new creation in Christ. And, and so as we read from Exodus chapter 12, I want you to uh, listen, pay careful attention to uh, the way this feast would then become an, an anticipation of the coming of Messiah, both his first coming and also his second coming. So pay, pay uh, attention to verses like verse 5, a lamb unblemished, um, not breaking any bone in verse 46. And also pay attention to what happened to the person who chose not to observe the Passover. I think in, in, the, in, in our day and age, we think the Lord's Supper is no big deal. Uh, it's okay if I, I, I partake and eat or I don't. Uh, it's just as important to be partaking by faith the Lord's Supper today as it would have been partaking of the lamb and the, last, the, the Passover in the time of Egypt. So I want you to give your, your full attention to the reading of God's word. This is a, a longer passage, uh, but we'll be reading verses 1 through 42. Here in the living word of the living God. Now the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be the beginning of months for you. It is to be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, 
On the tenth of this month, they are each one to take a lamb for themselves according to their father's households, a lamb for each household. Now if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his neighbor nearest to his house are to take one according to the number of persons in them, according to what each man should eat, you are to divide the lamb. Your lamb shall be an unblemished male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill it at twilight. Moreover, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that same night, roasted with fire, and they shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled at all with water, but rather roasted with fire, both its head and its legs, along with its entrails. And you shall not leave any of it over until morning, but whatever is left of it until morning you shall burn with fire. Now you shall eat it in this manner with your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will go through the land of Egypt on that night, and will strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Now this day will be a memorial to you, and you shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You are to celebrate it as a permanent ordinance. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, but on the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses, for whoever eats Anything leavened from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. On the first day you shall have a holy assembly, and another holy assembly on the seventh day. No work at all shall be done on them except what must be eaten by every person that alone may be prepared by you. You shall also observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread, for on this very day I brought your hosts out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, you shall observe this day throughout your generations as a permanent ordinance. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the 21st day of the month at evening. Seven days there shall be no leaven found in your houses. For whoever eats what is leavened, that person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is an alien or a native of the land. You shall not eat anything leavened in all your dwellings. You shall eat unleavened bread. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and take for yourselves lambs according to your families and slay the Passover lamb. You shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood which is in the basin and apply some of the blood that is in the basin to the lintel and the two doorposts, and none of you shall go outside the door of his house until morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to come in to your houses to smite you. And you shall observe this event as an ordinance for you and your children forever." When you enter the land which the Lord will give you, as he promised, you shall observe this right. And when your children say to you, What does this right mean you, to you? You shall say, It is a Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the sons of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians, but spared our homes. And the people bowed low and worshipped. Then the sons of Israel went and did so, just as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. Now it came about at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sat on his throne, to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of cattle. Pharaoh arose in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was no home where there was not someone dead. Then they called for Moses and Aaron at night and said, Rise up. Get out from among my people, both you and the sons of Israel, and go. Worship the Lord, as you have said. Take both your flocks and your herds, as you have said, and go, and bless me also. The Egyptians urged the people to send them out of the land in haste, for they said, We will all be dead. 
So the people took their dough before it was leavened with their kneading bowls bound up in their clothes on their shoulders. Now the sons of Israel had done according to the word of Moses, for they had requested from the Egyptians articles of silver and articles of gold and clothing. Now the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they let them have their request. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. Now the sons of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth, about 600,000 men on foot, aside from children. A mixed multitude also went up with them, along with flocks and herds, a very large number of livestock. They baked the dough, which they had brought out of Egypt, into cakes of unleavened bread, for it had not become leavened, since they were driven out of Egypt and could not delay, nor had they prepared any provisions for themselves. Now the time that the sons of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. And at the end of 430 years, to the very day, all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. Please turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. you reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and also from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And the title of this morning's sermon is Christ our Passover Lamb has been sacrificed. And that comes from our, our reading here in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Been, uh, again, as I mentioned uh, earlier, we've been preaching through summer sermon requests. We've looked at psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. We've looked at Sola Deo Gloria, insights for studying Philippians. Uh, we've looked at uh, arrogance and stage cage Calvinism. We've looked at, uh, last week, anthropomorphism was the sermon request, uh, looking at Old Testament references to God's eyes, his ears, his emotions, uh, his wrestling with Jacob, and understanding these in light of the incarnation of Jesus. And today's sermon request is on the, the Lord's Supper. So as I uh, mentioned, we've been discussing for almost a year about increasing the frequency of uh, our Lord's Supper observance. And before we make this change, I'd like to preach a few sermons on the topic. Um, I'm not sure if I'll do that in the next couple of weeks or over the next couple of months when we have our, our monthly celebration. Um, but the, the hope and the plan, it's not yet set in stone, but uh, perhaps by uh, January uh, to begin. Um, again, the, the session appreciates uh, feedback and comments, and, and we welcome that still. And I, I appreciate uh, the things that people have, have said. <clears throat> we also have new families, um, so this may be new to you. Uh, so you're welcome to give your feedback uh, as well. So I'll be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verses 6 through 8 and chapter 11 and verses 23 through 32. Again, hear the living word of the living God. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump, just as you are in fact unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, also has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And if you turn with me to chapter 11 and verses 23 through 32. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick, and a number sleep. But if we judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord, so that we will not be condemned along with the world." 
So then, my brethren, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that you will not come together for judgment. The remaining matters I will arrange when I come. And let us pray. We thank you for your word. We thank you in the new covenant that we are uh, redeemed and assembled before uh, Mount Zion. Uh, everything that was foreshadowed in the, the old covenant, we thank you, Jesus, that you are the, the fulfillment and, and the reality. We thank you as, as you taught that you are one who is greater than Solomon. You are greater than the, the building of the temple. And uh, we thank you for your teaching, destroy this temple, and I will raise it in three days. And we thank you for that resurrection. We thank you for your ascension. And we thank you, Jesus, as our great high priest, how you continue to make intercede, uh, intercession for us before the Father. We thank you for the gift of the pouring forth of the Holy Spirit. And we thank you for your being the fulfillment of the Passover and for instituting uh, the, the new covenant Passover as, as we remember uh, you as our sacrifice, that once for all sacrifice uh, for the atonement of sin. Well, Lord, I pray that as your word is proclaimed, that we, you would grant to us the Spirit so that we would hear your voice and the preaching of the word, and that you would impress upon us a, a greater sense of the, the importance of this meal as we, as we think about the importance of the meal in the, the old covenant, how much more so that it would be uh, very important to us, that we would not dismiss it, uh, that, that we would take more seriously um, uh, if those of us who, who haven't partaken of the Lord's Supper, um, who, who have never come to the Lord's table. Oh Lord, will you awaken them? Uh, will you awaken the rest of us to the, the, the judgment that awaits for those who die in their trespasses and sins? And oh Lord, may that final, that judgment that you took upon yourself at the cross as the Passover lamb, may it lead to faith and repentance and, and many men and women and children in this generation uh, confessing you, but also sitting uh, at your table as we anticipate your return in the fighting, final wedding supper of the Lamb. And we ask these things in your name. Amen. So as we begin looking at the, the Lord's Supper uh, this morning, uh, to remind you from our text in Exodus chapter 12, but also Jesus' institution of the Lord's Supper, um, it is a memorial. Do this in remembrance of me. And the Passover was an annual memorial, remembering God's deliverance of Israel from Egypt. We read in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 14, Now this day will be a memorial to you, and you shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You are to celebrate it as a permanent ordinance. Uh, in the next chapter, in Exodus chapter 13, which we didn't read from, but Moses said to the people, remember. So here, again, is this idea of a, a, a memorial, a remembrance. Uh, it actually becomes part of the fourth commandment. Um, a few chapters later, in Exodus chapter uh, 20, and uh, one of the reasons for remembering the Sabbath day uh, is because of their redemption from Egypt. But here the memorial is a, a yearly memorial, Exodus 13 and verse 3. Uh, remember this day in which you went out from Egypt from the house of slavery, for by a powerful hand the Lord brought you from this place, and nothing leavened shall be eaten. The Passover was part of a week-long festival known as the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So you had the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and that's one of the reasons Paul talks about uh, removing the leaven of our lives, uh, removing all any and all sin, just as God's, our forefathers in the Old Covenant had to remove all of the, the leaven from their, their homes. Uh, in a similar way, uh, there's to be no sin in our homes, uh, in our lives, no, no hidden sin. So a complete removal of, of that leaven. So you had the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread that was a week-long festival, and then on the eighth day of that, that festival, you had the Passover. And, and sometimes the scriptures speak of those eight days simply as uh, the, the Passover, or they can speak of that those eight days as the Feast of Unleavened Bread, um, as is the, the case in Deuteronomy chapter 16 and verse 3. So every year our forefathers would eat this memorial meal, um, remembering how God had remembered his covenant with Abraham. That's how Exodus begins in chapter 2. God hears the cry of his people. 
So they are groaning under the, the oppression of Pharaoh and their taskmasters. And God hears the, the, the prayers, the groaning of his people. And Exodus chapter 2 says that God remembered. So God remembered his covenant with Father Abraham. And in remembering his covenant with Father Abraham, Abraham, you remember, throughout the book of Genesis, he, he didn't have a kid for such a long time, and God had promised that his, his seed would be more numerous than the, the, seed of the, uh, than the sand of the, the sea, the stars of the sky, the dust of the earth. So you get to the book of Exodus, uh, more than 400 years later, and now you have over 600,000 men, not including the women and the children. And now Israel has become a great nation. And now this great nation who is being uh, enslaved, they are crying out and God remembers. God remembers and he calls us to remember um, as well. <clears throat> remember God's covenant. Remember the blood of the covenant. Remember the judgment for unbelief. So this is a meal not just of salvation. It's a meal warning us of a judgment. Even in 1 Corinthians, right? There is death for those who are not removing the leaven from their lives. There is death for those who are not partaking uh, with the, the hand and the heart of faith. And, and remember um, the, the death of the firstborn. Um, I, you know, I imagine having this conversation with your household. In fact, my household has had this before uh, with our children. Uh, imagine if the blood of the lamb were not on your door. Who in your household would have died? So I was a firstborn child, so I, I would have died. And, and you can think of that. This is history, right? This is something that happened in flesh and blood history, just as the incarnation, which we celebrate today, the bread and the cup, the incarnation in flesh and blood history, the Son of God took upon himself flesh and blood and the judgment that was due for our sin. And if you do not believe, if you do not partake of this supper, you have no life in you. Th th these are not just idle words for you. They are your life. So imagine who would have uh, died. Imagine who would have been spared, right? The, so there were there, the, the firstborn of every Israelite household was, was spared. And as time went on from the book of Exodus, and, and you go to Moses, and then the prophets, and the Psalms, as, as things progressed and as the tabernacle came to Jerusalem and in the days of David and Solomon when the temple was built, uh, you, you have uh, the understanding of this, week, uh, this yearly observance of the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Passover. It begins to take more and more meaning upon itself, and God gives it more meaning. So there's a prophetic meaning. So in the remembrance, God's people were looking back. They were looking back to uh, the exodus from Egypt and what God had done for their forefathers, but they're also looking to a future redemption so that the Passover remembrance or the Feast of Unleavened Bread uh, becomes uh, part of the Psalter, doesn't it? Psalms 113 through 118, uh, the Egyptian Hallel, it's known as. Th those are Psalms specifically uh, like catechizing, they are about uh, the, the Passover feast. Not just the past, but a present in how we are to live in the future. So we'll be, uh, we've been singing from these psalms. Remember Jesus on the way uh, to Gethsemane after he had instituted the, the Lord's Supper. He sang a hymn with his disciples. It's very likely, and this is what you'll find in the commentaries, it was Psalm 118, part of that celebration of the Passover, looking forward to uh, this is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it, anticipating uh, the coming of the greater son of David. And what happens in the scriptures is the Passover became one of the central themes of the prophets, looking forward to a greater exodus and new covenant. So I'd like to give you a few examples from the book of Isaiah, since that's where we're, Lord willing, be resuming our, our expository preaching through the book of Isaiah. I think we'll be picking up right around chapter 25. Um, next month, but, but think of the, the way in which the, the language of the Passover becomes the, the, the prophetic hope of the Psalms or the, the prophets. So in Isaiah chapter 1, and it's not, just a, um, it's not just salvation, there's a warning of judgment. So I'll, 
I'll, I'll pick up you know, one or two on judgment, but there's a future salvation. But you should understand that if you're not partaking of this meal today, why not? That, that's the, you, you should be asking, and we'll, we'll get back to Exodus chapter 12, it's a catechetical meal. What does this mean? You should be asking. This is the most important meal that you can eat. It is a meal pertaining to eternal life. And of course, you must partake of it by faith. But in that, that faith should lead you out then with the hand of faith to reach out to the body and blood of Jesus. In other words, it's not just enough to say when you're talking about remembering and memorial. It's not just something that happens in your head. It's something that happens with your hand. In Exodus chapter 2, when God remembered Israel in his covenant with Abraham, it wasn't just a mental remembrance like he'd forgotten. Of course, God doesn't forget. Well, he forgets our sins, but, uh, but we'll talk about that later in the Lord's Supper. But, but God, in remembering, what does he do with his hand? With a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, he redeems his people. So there's something that happens in the mind that leads to the hand. And it's the same thing for the people of God. You can say, I believe, I believe, wonderful, praise God for that. But believing and remembering isn't just something that happens up here. It leads to reaching out. It leads to reaching out in the hand of faith. And in the old covenant, it meant reaching out and sacrificing that lamb. It meant taking that blood and the hyssop and put it on your doorpost and the lintel of your home. So it wasn't just this mental thing. So many people today, they stay at home and they say, I'm a Christian and I worship God in my own way. No, 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 no. I, I, I praise God that you believe in the Lord. But you need to assemble. You need to gather with the, the people of God. And you need to be partaking with the people of God in the sacraments that Jesus Christ has ordained. So if you look with me at Isaiah chapter 1 and how the, the Lord's Supper then, God is teaching his people about his son that he will send who will bring redemption to the world. But there's a warning. If you do not believe, if you are not eating, you're not believing in faith, you will die in your sins. Some of the hardest discussions Jesus had in John chapter 6 and John chapter 8 were with his Jewish brethren. People whose forefathers had been there in Exodus chapter 12. And Jesus would teach that unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. That everything that the Passover was looking forward to was the incarnation, his death, his resurrection. And now, for us, we are looking forward to his return. This is not a meal, brothers and sisters, and for those who have not partaken, that you can dismiss and say this is unimportant. It's not something you can stay home and say, church doesn't have anything for me. God doesn't have anything for me there that I can't find at home. No, there, there's something here that you cannot find anywhere else. In Ex Isaiah chapter 1, verses 3 through 7, an ox knows its owner, and a donkey its master's manger. But Israel does not know. My people do not understand. Alas, sinful nation, people weighed down with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, sons who act corruptly. It's a very sad way that Isaiah opens. And in Exodus, you remember, the, the, there's the echoes of the Exodus here. In Exodus, let my people go. But now in Isaiah's day, my people... There's my people. That's the covenant language. I will be your God, and you will be my people. My people do not understand. In Exodus, God said to Pharaoh, Israel is my son. Let my son go. But in Isaiah's day, what do we read in verse 4? God's sons have acted corruptly. And you remember what happened to Pharaoh's son, his firstborn son. He died because of the hardness of Pharaoh's heart. And now God's son Israel in Isaiah's day, their heart was hardening just like Pharaoh's. And God's people were not understanding. They were not understanding the Passover. And judgment was coming. Exile for both the north and the south. In Isaiah chapter 31, it was so bad in Isaiah's day that some of the Israelites were, turning, were returning to Egypt for salvation. Isaiah 31 and verse 1. Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and rely on horses and trust in chariots because they are many and in horsemen because they are very strong, but they do not look to the Holy One of Israel nor seek the Lord. So God had saved Israel from Egypt in Isaiah's day. God's people, though, were returning back to Egypt, not to God for deliverance. And now in Isaiah's day, judgment 
was going to begin with the household of the Lord. After Israel came out of Egypt in Exodus chapter 12, God brought his people to Mount Sinai, and God revealed to Isaiah that in the day of Messiah, all nations would be brought to his mountain. So you think at Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter 19, but listen to Isaiah chapter 2 as he's looking forward to the coming of Messiah. So there's both, there's both a salvation and a judgment. The salvation is through faith. The salvation is by partaking of the Passover lamb. The judgment is by hardening your heart, not believe, not reaching out that hand in faith. Isaiah says, and this is the day in which we live today. Now it will come about in that day, in the last days, the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains and will be raised above the hills and all the nations will stream to it. And many peoples will come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For the law will go forth from Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So you have the law going forth in Moses' day from Mount Sinai. Today, Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw amen to him myself. And as he ascended to the right hand of God the Father in Acts chapter 2, what do we have? The pouring forth of the Spirit at Pentecost, and now the nations streaming in to worship in spirit and truth. These were all anticipated by the Exodus. These are what the Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms then are beginning to build upon in the Old Testament. Isaiah was inspired by the Holy Spirit to proclaim the work of the suffering servant as a new Exodus. There would be a greater Passover. There would be the death of a single lamb for the whole world. In Isaiah chapter 52 and verse 12, uh, the Lord says to his people through Isaiah, but you will not go out in haste. Well, remember, that was, that's Passover language, but there's going to be something different in this deliverance, in this salvation, a greater salvation. Um, Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 1, to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Right? This is, we're coming up to the suffering servant passage. Think of the Exodus, the Passover language, that the right hand of the Lord saving, redeeming his people. That was some of the anthropic language we looked at last week from Exodus chapter 15. Now there would be a reaching down, and here's the incarnational language, and there would be a new covenant in the blood of this lamb. Isaiah 53 and verse 7, like a lamb led to the slaughter. And it recalls again the exodus, the Passover lamb that dies so that God's people might live. And the Spirit of the Lord leads Isaiah then in Isaiah 53 to speak that not only would this Passover lamb die, he would be raised again. And through the anguish of his soul, he would see his work. And it would be a work drawing all the nations to himself. Isaiah 59 verse 20, a redeemer will come to Zion. And that's the language, of course, of Exodus chapter 6 and verse 6, God redeeming his people. Um, when you go to the last book of the Bible, there's a lot of Exodus and Passover imagery in the book of Revelation, isn't it? Isn't there? Because the Passover not only looked forward to the first coming of Jesus, but it also looks forward to the second coming of Jesus. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. So that, that, that is Exodus, that is Passover imagery, isn't it? So beautiful. I saw a lamb in Revelation chapter 5 and verse 6. So John on the Lord's day, right? So this is the Lord's day. I saw a lamb standing as if slain. There's the Passover lamb, but this Passover lamb now stands as if slain. And he, uh, he goes to the throne where the Father is, and he receives all authority. Worthy is the lamb that was slain. Uh, Revelation chapter 7 and verse 3. Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the bondservants of our God on their foreheads. And again, here's another e echo of Exodus chapter 12. Because the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Uh, I'm not, I'm really going to talk a whole lot about the book of Revelation and your end times views, but when you hear people talk, you know, I think we're living in the end times. Th that's great and that's wonderful. These are the last days indeed. That means you should be eating the Passover. You should be eating the new covenant Passover. You really believe that we live in the last days. This is not a time for you to ignore um, the, the importance of preparing for the coming of the Lord. 
So here we have this, again, this is a, a memorial meal. Again, it's not just a memorial where you think about eating and drinking, right? It's where you have to reach out with the hand of faith. And it's a prophetic meal anticipating Messiah's salvation of the world and ultimately the new heavens and the new earth. And the Passover, and this is the, one of the things I, I want you to, to listen carefully and understand, the Passover was a, a type of a catechism. It was a catechism to be remembered and partaken of forever. Now, if you're familiar with the Westminster Shorter Catechism, you know it's in a question and answer format. You know, what is the chief end of man? Man's chief end. So it begins with a question, what is God? God is a spirit. So there, there's a question and answer. And the Passover, there's a, a, it's a catechetical meal as well. In Exodus chapter 12, you remember which we read from in verses 25 through 27, the Lord said, when you enter the land where the Lord will give you as his promise, you shall observe this right. And when your children say to you, what does this right mean to you? There's the question. And now it's the answer in verse 27. The parents are saying, it is a Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the sons of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians but spared our homes. And the people bowed low and worshiped. So, you know, little Joey or little Zedekiah, whatever their, the kids' names were, right? You live because the lamb died. Or your, your firstborn brother lives because a lamb died. What does this mean? This is why we celebrate it. Because the Lord commanded this, and there is going to be another lamb, the lamb of God, through the greatest of the Old Testament prophets, right? This was his message, the lamb of God. Behold, the lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Think of all those catechetical meals that God's people observe for generation after generation after generation. And now the greatest of the prophets points his finger and says, there, there he is. You also have catechetical psalms that are anticipating what the, God's people, what we're doing in our celebration of the Lord's Supper, and uh, how it is teaching our children uh, as well. So in Psalm 34, which is an alphabetic psalm, so remember that the Hebrew alphabet has 22 letters. This is a psalm with 22 verses. So each verse begins with the, the Hebrew equivalent, you know, A, B, C, D, all the way down through Z, the last letter of the alphabet. And, and we'll be singing from Psalm 34 uh, in verses 17 through 22. But remember verse 8, taste and see that the Lord is good. Verse 17, the righteous cry in the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. That's just like the Passover, God's people in Exodus chapter 2, crying out. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Think about the brokenhearted, the crushed Israelites whose, whose firstborn sons were being tossed into the Nile. And God hearing and answering. God hearing little Miriam who followed her, her brother, uh, Moses, who is drawn out. God heard the, 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 the cries of little Miriam and Moses was, was saved. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. There is deliverance. There is salvation. He keeps all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Ah, John 19, right? We're, now we're beginning to realize that we're not just talking about what happened in Exodus. There's a greater Exodus. There's one who would have hyssop there at the cross. There's one whose bones would not be broken. To teach God's people that everything that you've been celebrating in the Passover, this memorial, there he is. That's why his bones were not broken. The thieves' bro legs were broken, not this one, because the Lord preserved his son. And, the, and then the psalm ends, the Lord redeems the soul of his servants, and none of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. You took refuge in a home of a believing Israelite with the, the blood of the lamb on the doorpost, you were saved. You take refuge in Jesus, you will be saved. Everything the Jews have been catechized about the Passover and the Exodus, from the time of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms, Jesus said in the night in which he was betrayed, essentially this, I am the answer to this catechism. You are looking at him. This is my body, right? He, he takes the, the bread. This is my body. Do this in what? Remembrance of me. Don't just think about it in your mind. Take and eat. This is my body for you. This is the new covenant in my blood in remembrance of me. Blood shed for you. Do you believe in that? If you believe Jesus' blood was shed from you, there's no reason why you or your parents should be keeping you from the Lord's table. 
You, you, you need to be coming to the Lord's table and partaking in faith. The disciples saw in the cross everything that they had been catechized about from the time of Moses, everything they had been catechized in for centuries from the time of the prophets and throughout the Psalms. Jesus is the fulfillment of it all. And our celebration of the new covenant Passover is no less important than the Jewish celebration going all the way back to the time of Moses. It's no less important for your children or for you to be catechizing your children of their need to personally confess Jesus as Lord and Savior of their lives. Now, as we come to the frequency of the Lord's Supper, and, and I want to make very clear right from the outset, the frequency of the Lord's Supper is not mandated in Scripture. Uh, we read from 1 Corinthians 11, you know, for as often as you do this, or, or whenever. So the frequency is not mandated in Scripture. But one of the things that I, I, I have observed is that when we did observe communion more frequently, uh, about 10 years ago, before we started the Oneida Center ministry, the children, week after week, were realizing there's a part of the worship service that I am not a part of, right? It's, it's, and if you ever hand out the elements or you just look at the kids you know, around you, you're, you're handing them out, and what are the little kids doing? It's their natural reaction, right? They're reaching out for the bread. They, they want to participate. Now, we're not looking for a natural reaction, are we? We're looking for a supernatural hungering and thirsting. But there is this recognition for the, the children, and, and this is a catechetical time. This is a, a time for teaching our children about the most important meal in the world. The, yes, you, th this is a meal. This is representing. This is looking to Jesus. And Jesus is the one who forgives sins. And, and I pray that you would have a hunger, not, just, not because this is snack time, but that you would have a hunger. And I hope as adults you have this same hunger too and that you never lose it. There's a hungering and a thirsting for righteousness that nothing in this world can satisfy, that only Christ can satisfy, and that's why you're reaching out the hand of faith. And what I've, I noticed is that the more frequently we observe the Lord's Supper, the more kids were asking, how can I do this? And, and by the way, parents, your children, if they're five or six, they're not too young to begin. They're, they're probably already asking you theological questions anyway that are very profound, um, which is not a surprise. But, but don't keep the, the, your children hungry. If, if you have a sense that they really do have a sense of their sin, that they need to change, they need help changing, bring them to the session. They, they may be ready to be, be starting to talk about taking the Lord's Supper. We don't put an age on this. And it has to be an age-appropriate faith, parents. So you may be you know, 40 years old, and your child may not be the great theological scholar that you are, but it, it's, it's with a faith. It's a reaching out saying, I need Christ. I realize that I'm not just a stomach. I realize God has made me with a body and a soul. And there is a food and a work that Christ has done that only he can work in my heart and my life. And I want to reach out in faith for Christ. Don't hinder little ones from the Lord's table. I have to emphasize, though, for, to you, you as well as, as young people, you, mu you must make Christ your own. You, you, I, I want to be blunt, but I, I want to be very careful. You, young people, you, you will not go to heaven based on your parents' profession of faith. You're, it's not like you can ride on their coattails and say, you know what, it doesn't matter. It, it, this is of the utmost importance, and hopefully your parents are already teaching you how important faith in Christ is and how important this catechetical meal is that you partake of faith. But you must make Christ your own. And that, that's our, our prayer. Parents, I hope that that's your prayer for your children. That, uh, I have six kids, and the, the most important thing to me as a father, the most important thing in all of the world, is that my children would make a public confession of faith. That, that, that God would do for them what I can't do as a parent. I cannot give my child a new heart. That is impossible. I can't. And so I have to pray to my heavenly father, right? God, will you give my children a, a new heart? Will you give them not just a sense that their stomach is empty and they're hungry, but will you give them a sense of the hungering and the thirsting for Christ himself? Is that little hand reaches out and you say, no, you're not ready. But as that little hand reaches out 
God, will you bless my teaching, my catechizing, my children as they ask about these things so that they, through your grace, will inherit these things for themselves? You know that we're not Baptists, right? So we baptize our children. But think of how important baptism is to the Baptist. It's just important to us as Presbyterians. But that emphasis on making a, public, a profession of faith, for us, that lands on the Lord's Supper. That, that is where the emphasis is placed. We believe that there must be a work of the Spirit of God in the heart of every individual. And again, I want to emphasize to you young people, you're not going to heaven just because you go to church every week. It's very important. And praise God that your, your parents make sure that you go to church. But you need to make Christ your own. And I want to ask you, parents, are you catechizing and training your children about the necessity of a personal faith in Jesus? Are you diligently teaching your children that they must be reaching out with the hand of faith? Are you praying to your Heavenly Father about these things for your children? And do they hear you praying these things for them? Are you taking advantage of the opportunities that the church gives um, for teaching your children, all of the youth programs that are going on, the, the kids' camps. These are opportunities for your children to be hearing the gospel in different contexts. And now, one of the, the main objections against celebrating more frequently is that if I celebrate the Lord's Supper more frequently, it will be less meaningful to me. Now, that may be true for you. I'm not sure. But here's another way of thinking about it it might actually impress upon you the urgency of salvation more. Because the, the Lord's Supper, yes, it is for me. Do this in remembrance of me. But if you knew that the destroying angel were coming tonight, would you have a sense of urgency to share the gospel with your family members, your neighbors, those who don't know Christ? Wouldn't, wouldn't there be a sense that th this, is, this is it? that what we're doing each in, on the Lord's Day today, this is the most important meal I could ever invite someone to. So one of my prayers is that, I, I think that we, as, as Christians, can lose a sense of the urgency that today is the day of salvation. Don't, don't put off Christ for another meal. Don't put off Christ for another day. You must be putting your faith. This, this is the time. Second Corinthians, Paul says, and working together with him, we also urge you not to receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, at the acceptable time I listened to you, and on the day of salvation I helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Let us pray. Oh Lord, we, we thank you for your word, and we thank you, Jesus, for uh, not only instituting uh, the, the Lord's Supper, the, the new covenant Passover. We thank you that you are the, the meaning of the Passover, that you are the fulfillment. You are the, everything that Moses and the prophets and the Psalms was, was looking forward to, everything that your people have been catechized about and catechizing their, their, their households and their children, uh, that you, Jesus, are, are the fulfillment. Uh, we, we thank you that we, we hear these things in the preaching of, of your word and that we hear by faith and through the work of your spirit. Lord, will you help us to respond? With, by believing these things and, and by asking those catechetical questions of our parents, you know, what does this mean? And, 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 and do I need to put my faith in trust? Do I need to have a, a, a profession of faith? Does, does God need to give me a new heart? Oh, Lord, will you, you make our, these, will you, through your, 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 the sacrament, this, this visible sign, uh, will you cause it, and those who never partake, to, to begin asking these questions, these most important questions. And, oh, Lord, as, as we sit at the table today, will you also impress upon us the, the urgency of believing in you? Will, you? will you give to us an assurance of, of the blessedness of our sins being forgiven, that indeed uh, you have forgotten our sins, that you have removed them as far as the east from the west, but that, that we are sitting at a meal... And we are sitting in a world that is like Egypt, that is under your wrath. As your word says, he who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life, for God's wrath remains on him. Will you impress upon us, as we're sitting and partaking, of those loved ones, our, those ar around us, 
that are still dead in their transgression and sin, upon whom your wrath resides. And, O oh Lord, will you give to us a greater sense of the urgency of, of praying for these individuals and praying that you open uh, doors of opportunity uh, for us to share about your salvation and to invite them and say, taste and see for yourself. The Lord is good. Oh Lord, may we see a great revival in turning back to you in this generation. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.